Hello everybody, Realm Builder Guy here, and welcome back to the channel, and to my very first Imperator Rome guide, and it is a, as you can read of course, uh, five fun starts or interesting starts here in Imperator Rome. I've done these now, quite a few of these uh, types of videos for Crusader Kings 3. One thing with about Imperator, we've got one starting date, so it does make it a little bit not simpler, but a little bit less uh, options to choose from, which some like, some don't like. I personally like because it's always hard to figure out the perfect place to start. And as always in these guys, it's going to be some history behind these five starts that I've picked. Not totally at random, but you know, they're, they're my choices that I find interesting. And I may do, or I definitely will do more of these in the future here for Imperator Rome. But these are five that I just find would be interesting ones to start with that aren't the typical. So we're not gonna have Carthage, we're not gonna have Rome, we're not gonna have any of the Diadochi. So if you're looking for that, then I don't know, maybe I'll do one on those individually at some point, but right now, that's not what this is about. Of course, as always, all likes are greatly appreciated, so if you can drop a like, uh, that would be fantastic. It'll help the channel grow and the videos be seen. Also, don't forget to drop a comment if you have played with any of these five that I am highlighting here. If there are other ones you'd like to be in the contention for future videos like this also let me know those down in the comments so without any more delay let's dive into it first up we are visiting gaul that's why right we are right here in kind of central gaul with well let's take a quick look with the nation of the arvernia or the arverni Historically speaking, let me go over that kind of stuff right away in the beginning, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the strategies and uniqueness within the game itself. Now, the Arverni are one of the most, or were one of the most powerful tribes in all of Gaul uh, in the modern region of the Auvergne, so in France. So, obviously, you can see where that name has stuck around in modern times. They actually expanded into a significantly larger empire here in Gaul over time, dominating most of the region. The first recorded uh, mention of the Arverni was in 207 BC when they had a treaty actually with Carthage. Um, I'm assuming down here in a trade agreement, but I'm not 100% sure. It just said treaty with Car Carthage, so. All right, but they became powerful due to their technological advances and metallurgy and weapons, which is obviously very closely tied. That means they, mean they had a military advantage over their neighbors, which of course was one of the key aspects in tribal life. If you had that advantage, well, that definitely helps. On top of that, they were known for mining and trade. So they had money, they had the metals, and they had the weapons. Uh, their most famous chief, of course, is Vercingetorix, uh, who is mainly the main reason why I decided to pick this. And at the beginning of every Asterix and Obelix um, comic book, you actually highlight Vercingetorix. And Vercingetorix was the uh, Averni chieftain who led the Gallic Revolt against Caesar in 52 BC, but of course was eventually defeated at the Battle of Elysia. Uh, they themselves, so the Averni themselves, they, they strongly diminished already in 121 BC after their first major conflict with the Romans. Uh, between when Vercingetorix revolted against Caesar and that first loss to the Romans in 121, there's a lot of speculation that they actually changed into a form of a constitutional oligarchy oligarchy as a form of government, which I find very intriguing given the area. Um, historically, they, the tribal chiefs or the Avernis were also deeply involved in the early Frankish state. But what really did them in was the first the invasion of the Alamans and then later the Visigoths, who the Visigoths conquered and defeated them in AD 475, which then led to their continued 
diminishment and basically the entire kingdom and the holdings fell apart. But uh, they still had nobles that were at the Frankish court later on. So why did I pick them? I picked them because of that history with Vercingetorix and because of your strategic location here in the center of Gaul. You're also very well poised to actually form Gaul, which is a formable nation. What's nice, also, you have some strategic advantages. You have this impassable terrain, these mountains right here, that make it very hard to be attacked from the south. You really just have this one point here to attack from the south, everything else around here uh, to the north, west, and east. But it gives you a little bit of a a buffer to the eventual growth of the Romans. So that that is a good strategic advantage. So maybe, you know, you put a fort down here and you kind of strengthen these areas just to strengthen your southern border to the eventual expansion of Rome. And Rome will be coming for you. The other thing, of course, is you can take over your neighbors at, at a decent enough rate. Uh, you've got a good population of 85. You've got a decent amount of treasury. Uh, you've got good manpower. I mean, they are the Arvernia. If you're going to pick a tribe, now there are a lot to choose from here, of course. But if you're going to pick a tribe to form Gaul, they are one of my personal picks, both historically and just how they start. Uh, so those are the Arverni. So next, we head to Africa and to the Kingdom of Kush. Now, the first thing you'll see here, that basically the only terrain that you have, even though this looks huge, uh, is really just along the Nile River. Uh, so it gives you uh, some you know, strategic pinch points as far as people trying to conquer you from the north or the south. So strengthening that north is really important. But before I get into some strategies, let's give you a little bit of history on Kush. Now, this was a very advanced ancient civilization in what is now Sudan. Actually, in the 20th, late 20th century, a lot of archaeology and then also early 21st century have found that Kush uh, were very advanced, especially in mathematics, which is very interesting, as well as irrigation is, of course, they had to irrigate from the Nile River to have any type of agriculture or economy. Now, they had very close ties, as one would imagine, to the Egyptians, uh, even though they did fall under Egypt's rule for about 500 years. Following the collapse of Egypt in the late Bronze Age, a new kingdom of Kush, new Kushite kingdom, was established. And in fact, the kings of Kush ruled Egypt for a short period, about a century, until they were driven out by the Assyrians. Uh, though diminished over time bit by bit as uh, first the Macedonians conquered Egypt and the northern realm here, Kush used to extend to about eh, right here where the P is, and then later the Romans, Kush did have a pretty good relationship both with the Macedonians and the Romans and the Ptolemaic kings of Egypt in the meantime. Uh, but of course, because of that, they couldn't really expand to the north and to the south. There were growing powers specifically here in Aksum. And Aksum eventually conquered Kush in the fourth century AD. So why would you play Kush? Well, first of all, you could go over here and try to take on Egypt, but you've got a pretty good defensible position. You've got this one pinch point. Anybody coming from the north has to come through here. So focusing on that would be really important. And maybe keeping these guys here to your north, uh, the Dodecacionos, easy for me to say, as kind of a border between yourself and Egypt might not be bad. But then you can and should expand to the south and conquer all of the lands you possibly can. You are in a great position to become the dominant power in this entire region before the Egyptians or the Seleucids come down and try to make your life hell. So obviously getting really close ties with the Egyptians would be very, very important. Uh, I don't believe you start with any diplomatic, you do actually, you're a client state of Egypt, so you can, oh no, those are those guys, sorry. Here we go. You have an export of cloth 
to Egypt. That's the key one. I was on the wrong one. I was completely irritated there for a second. So ignore all of that. But no, Kush, you are, of course, independent. Getting close with Egypt would be very important because they're just more powerful than you are at this time. I mean, you're not bad. Don't get me wrong. I mean, you've got 444 pops. You've got a good amount of gold, good amount of manpower. If you look at Egypt, they're, they're a little bit more powerful with 1,700 pops. So being on the good side of the Egyptians will be very, very important. So increasing your uh, their opinion of you always, uh, whenever you can, be their best buddies because then they're most likely going to leave you alone as you try to conquer all of this area of Northeast Africa and these southern parts of the Arabian Peninsula is another place that I would definitely advance into as Kush. So you're in a pretty good strategic position to do that. It'd be a lot of fun to kind of build that that strong African uh, nation to then take on Egypt and Carthage and so on. I think that would be a ton of fun. Next up, we head north again, and we are now on the southern coast of the Black Sea for the small nation of Heraclea Pontica. And there's a lot of interesting things here to unpack with Heraclea Pontica. Now, this was an ancient coastal city on the river Lycus. It was founded by the Greek city-state Megara around the year 560 BC. It was named after Heracles, or Hercules, as the Romans named him, who was rumored to have entered the underworld through a nearby cave. So that's kind of an interesting little side note. It was a very prosperous city that eventually established its own Black Sea colonies, something to keep in mind for a future strategy. Uh, it was eventually destroyed during the Mithridatic Wars in the years 88 to 63 BC. So it would be an interesting one to play. It's, it's very difficult. I mean, you only have a pop size of 27. Uh, you are here next to the Antigonids. You're between a lot of Diadokis. I mean, you have the Macedon, Thrace, the Antigonids, and then, of course, over here you have the Seleucids. You don't start allied with anybody. You've got a mini defensive league, but nothing major of note. But what I want to talk to you about is this lady right here. Amastris, and as you can see here, the first Achaemenid. Now, the Achaemenids, for those of you that don't know, those were that was the ruling dynasty of the ancient Persian Empire, the first Persian Empire. And she has some interesting things you can do here. Uh, she is actually the niece of the last Persian king, Darius III, Achaemenid. Uh, she was given in marriage to Craterus by Alexander the Great, but Craterus didn't want her, so he arranged a marriage for her with Dionysus of uh, Heraclea Pontica. And that's how she got here, and she had two sons with him. These two gentlemen right here, Oxyathres, as well as Clearchus. Oxyathres... I believe was actually the name of her father, so the brother of King Darius III of Persia. Now, she ruled uh, HP after her husband's death in 306 BC. She then married Basileos uh, Lysimachus of Thrace. So, uh, this guy right here, Lysimachus of Thrace, married him in the year 302, but it didn't last long. He actually abandoned her pretty early to marry the daughter of the first Ptolemaic pharaoh of Egypt, Ptolemy I. So, yeah, she was spurned twice in marriage, but it gets worse for our queen or our lady here, Amastris. She was actually murdered by her own sons. She was drowned by them in 284, and her former ex-husband of Thrace then killed her sons. Uh, so he was a little bit loyal to her. But what makes this one interesting, beyond the history and the backstory of Amastris and these crazy sons and so on, is that this is the only nation that can reform the Achaemenid Empire. Now, there are others that can form Persia. I mean, Armenia 
one of the best poised ones to do it. But if you want the Achaemenid dynasty, so the original ruling house of the ancient Persian Empire, you have to start here. And it is very, very difficult. This is a long-term play. Uh, Iron Man, it's an achievement. And it's considered one of the hardest achievements. Not the hardest. That is forming Babylon. And no, that is not part of this. <laughs> Uh, I'm not that big of a glutton for punishment, but you can't, it can be obviously be done, but it's going to be very difficult. The first moves you want to make is you want to ally with the Antigonids because they're going to be in a war. They're right on your doorstep. If you, you could also stay neutral in the wars of the Diadochi and kind of see who comes out on top. But the king of, or the Basileus of Thrace will offer you a marriage. So you can marry him. And then one of the sons, I believe, you leave the court and then one of the sons takes over. Uh, or you can spurn him and then they have a Cassus Belli, I believe, against you. So keep that in mind. The other thing is if you want the Achaemenid dynasty, every ruler has to stay in the Achaemenid dynasty or the Achaemenid empire. So you're in a precarious position because a lot of your neighbors here... Uh, Paphlagonia and Pontus and Cappadocia, they're going to go to war. Armenia is going to push in here. The Antigonids, Thracians, Macedonians, Seleucids, and Egyptians are going to throw down here really soon. So you're in a very uh, hostile environment. So that is one to really, you need to be strategic with your alliances. Otherwise, it could turn south really quickly. But I also kind of like the flag here. If I'm honest, it, it's kind of cool. I enjoy it. But that is Heraclea Pontica. So from the southern shores of the Black Sea, we head to the northern shores of the Black Sea to one of my absolute favorite nations, the Bosporan Kingdom. This is such a fun place to play because you're surrounded. You've got the Scythians here, the Sarmatians here. Then you've got a few Hellenistic colonies here as well. It's such a fun fun area plus you, eventually you may have some of these tribes move in here and you've got all this open area up here you could also expand and settle into so that's that's why the Bosporan kingdom is one of my favorites in Imperator Rome 2.0 or even previously so what is the Bosporan kingdom historically they were a Greco Scythian state and a true Hellenistic state of mixed population you had a lot of Scythians that were part of the Bosporan kingdom who then chose or got chosen <laughs> to speak Greek. So Greek was the dominant language of the region eventually. Now it was founded in 438 BC, combining a number of Greek cities that had come together here. Uh, it actually remained an independent kingdom until the year 630, 63 BC when it became a client state of Rome. It was eventually disestablished, fell to pieces in AD 370 after, to nobody's surprise, the Hunnic invasion. But in that time, you had uh, the longest ruling dynasty of the Spartakids for about 300 years. If we look here, uh, where are we? Da, 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 da. Nation, government, there we go. We have Spartacus the third Spartakid. And he was actually one who increased the wealth of the Bosporan kingdom. And one of the ways he did that was by building a very close partnership with Athens. Athens was always a trade partner of the Bosporan kingdom, but he built it beyond trade. It was a very, it was culturally mixed. It was militarily mixed. They had a very close relationship with Athens. He was also the first a uh, Bosporan ruler who called himself Basileos as he wanted to kind of copy the cool kids of the Diadochi. Uh, the wealth of the kingdom was predominantly based on exporting wheat, fish, and of course, slaves from this region that they would eventually capture. Now, as the Bosporan kingdom, I played this kind of just on my own. The first move I did was ally with Scythia and then start just gobbling up some of these neighbors here. Scythia will eventually go to war with Sarmatia, uh, which is another one I would go after if I were you, and then you'll want to look at going after Scythia before you move your way down south. But you could, I'm not going to say easily, but relatively easy. This is not a bad one to start to learn the mechanics if you don't want to play one of the big guys like Rome or the Seleucids or Antigonids. You're going to be left alone by everything that's happening down here with the Diadochi, so you can kind of 
expand and invest and make money and become a powerful trading and naval empire without any of those nations really bothering you for a long time. So this isn't quite Tutorial Island, but it's a great place to get used to the mechanics. And it's a really fun place to play because you don't have only have your Hellenistic culture, but you also have, of course, the Sarmatians. And Sarmatians, uh, you know, they give you some, some horses and the cultures here in Scythia as well. Of course, if you are your own nation, uh, let's see here, the nation over you, Bosporan Kingdom. I'm trying to see where where are we where are we well either way you have I'm trying to find it where are we regions doesn't show it right now but you start off with light cavalry and light infantry of course you are a kingdom so once you become a regional power you will have access to legions but Bosporan Kingdom would be a fun one to start. If you're looking for an easier one, kind of get to get used to Imperator Rome now 2.0, I highly recommend the Bosporan Kingdom. And finally, we head back to the Mediterranean and the southern reaches of Gaul and to Massilia. Massilia itself is a plutocratic, plutocratic republic that is very, very interesting. It's very popular, I know, but I figured I'd bring it in. Uh, one, um, one proud Bavarian did a little, I guess, not tutorial, kind of a review of 2.0 of Imperator Rome, and he showed his own playthrough with Massalia, which was really interesting and fun. Now, Massalia was a Greek colony founded around 600 BC by Ionians from Phocaea. It was a key trading post along the Mediterranean, and eventually they established their own trading colonies across Gaul in the 4th and 3rd centuries BC. They were also known for exploration, with explorers uh, exploring the coast of West Africa and Northwest Europe throughout this period. They were very close with Rome and actually allied with them during the Punic Wars. And after the fall of Carthage, they assumed trade control of the region and the Iberian coast because of course all of the Carthage colonies along here all eventually fell away um, and they were able to become the dominant trade force in this entire region kind of like from here up until here. Now they were eventually conquered by Caesar in 49 BC because they actually stayed neutral during the civil war that didn't sit well with Caesar, so he's like, yeah, you're mine now. Uh, the, and that was basically the end of Massalia. They, they became integrated within Roman society and Rome itself and ceased to be an independent nation, which is kind of a shame after 550 years of kind of slogging it out here on the coast of southern Gaul. Uh, they were a republic that was ruled by a closed aristocracy that actually descended from the original settlers. And speaking of original settlers, this was kind of an interesting side note I found, that in 2011, a genetic study of the area found that 4% of the population of the Provence in France actually can trace their ancestry to the Phocaean settlers of Massilia. So, very, very interesting. Okay, so... You're Massilia. You're you're this one. You are Crateros Bucalid. What do you do? Well, you know, trade empire is kind of a duh. Uh, gobble up some of your lesser neighbors around you and expand your hold on this key region. That would be my main focus, is this coastal region. Try to gobble up as much as possible. And then also look at building that historic alliance with Rome. Rome's going to dominate Italy sooner or later. So getting on their good side early would be really important. The other one to keep an eye on, of course, is Carthage. They're right over here and along the Iberian coast. But expanding along the coast and then a little bit inland, I'd say, until you get to Arvernia. Uh, because you've got these mountains here that are then strategic pinch points for you when it comes to uh, your enemies invading you, unless they want to land by sea. And sea is the other key one. Build up a good navy and start conquering around here. So Massilia, very, very interesting. The other thing is actually, now they were a Greek colony, but the Greeks, for uh, especially from Athens, didn't think very highly of them. 
Uh, they considered them weak, and it was actually a proverbial insult to say, you can go to Masilla, or you come from Masilla. It's almost saying like you're a weak person. So it's just kind of a s interesting side note. So you want to do a nice little role play historical build uh, or campaign with Masilla? It'd be a lot of fun to build a trade empire right around here, ally with Rome, and maybe, maybe uh, te you know those those Athenian Greeks show them that you are not a weak nation. So there you have it. Those are five fun starts here in Imperator Rome to get you started maybe thinking about a new campaign to play as a new playthrough now that 2.0 has launched there'll be some interesting ones that are not as popular as say Rome or one of the Diadochi or even my own playthrough as Sparta which you can find here on the channel so if you enjoyed this please hit that like button consider subscribing so you don't miss any Imperator Rome Let's Plays or Guides as well as Crusader Kings 3 and other gaming content here on the channel. Don't forget to check out the links in the description to Twitch, Twitter, uh, Patreon, my Nexus GG store where you can buy Imperator Rome along with its DLCs as well as Patreon and you can support the channel there. So until next time, I'm Realm Builder Guy and I will talk to you soon. Bye.